Thank you. Well, you've, um, we're, we're going to continue our discussion in this panel on the implementation of the Common Core. And I think you got a, more than a hint, more than a glimpse in this previous session on why the standards have been so widely and rapidly accepted in the care, thought, and, and skill that went into developing them. Uh, and you got some insights from the folks who wrote the standards about things you might want to think about as you proceed from adoption to implementation. In this session, we're going to take a step back from the standards themselves and focus on what it's going to take to get them implemented and addressed in the systems in which we educate students. And that will bring, I think, a slightly different set of, or additional set of interests and concerns uh, to the table. Uh, we've got a great panel to, intro to, to kick off our discussion on that. I'm going to introduce them in a moment. They're each going to take uh, f uh, five to seven minutes or so to lay out some initial remarks. Uh, and then uh, we're going to open it up for discussion with them and then come and open it up for discussion with, uh, with all of you. So we, uh, I'm anticipating a pretty lively uh, discussion uh, around these issues because I know it's something that everybody is concerned about, uh, all talking about, and, and, and we think there are going to be a lot of complex and big challenges at this part. I think, um, while David was right that writing the standards was no cakewalk, um, uh, uh, the next steps are going to be uh, at least as challenging, and it's going to be challenging for many more people than it, than it took uh, even the small army of people to write the standards uh, themselves. So I'm pleased that we're joined by, again, an excellent uh, panel here. I'm going to briefly introduce them, starting on my left, Andres Alonzo, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, I won't go into a long introduction for any of them, but Andres uh, uh, has experience. He was. Uh, a deputy chancellor of the New York City Public Schools before he became to Baltimore, uh, came to Baltimore. He's been an educator for his whole, uh, whole career, and uh, I had a wonderful talk with him just the other evening about the challenges and strategies he's using in Baltimore. I know you're going to find some, some really interesting, interesting perspectives and ideas there. Uh, to the far left, Lillian Lowry is the Secretary of Education in the Delaware Department of Education. She previously served as superintendent of the Christiana School District in Delaware uh, and spent more than 15 years in the classroom. And Delaware, as you know, is uh, one of the first two states to win a race to the top grant. So they've already got most of the reform implement, uh, uh, strategies implemented uh, all, <laughs> all, already. So we're, we're looking forward to hearing your successes after three months or so of, of funding. It shouldn't take much longer than that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, in, in the middle to my left is Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers. She's been president of AFT uh, uh, since July 2008, was a vice president of AFT for um, uh, 11 years before that, served uh, 12 years as president of the United Federation of Teachers in New York City, where I was educated. Thank you, Randy. Uh, and, um, Why did you have an education? <laughs> That's why I passed more of my courses. <laughs> Not everyone was tough, as tough a grader as Randy. I do need to tell you, shortly after Randy um, uh, became president, and I think it was the first or second day that you uh, uh, moved to your office in Washington, uh, she asked me to come meet with her, and she basically had two questions. One was, when the hell are we going to get the common standards effort moving? Uh, and secondly, when are we going to actually make sure that that leads to providing teachers with the tools, supports, and resources that they need? <coughs> and she periodically checked in on uh, that since, and I think she'll have some thoughts on that today as well. And then um, uh, 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 next to her is Vicki Phillips, who is the President for Education at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Vicki, I think I've known you for about 25 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. She was in the Kentucky. Department of Education when Kira was a landmark education reform, the really first comprehensive sweeping education, uh, uh, systemic education reform in the country. Uh, she was superintendent of schools in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, she was superintendent of schools in Portland Public Schools. I think I've got the order right. Between, between Lancaster and Portland, she stopped at Harrisburg to be secretary of education in Pennsylvania. So she brings to this local experience, state experience, and foundation experience, and a great national perspective. So we've got an outstanding panel to, to sort of kick off our discussion on, on the uh, implementation of the Common Core. I just want to frame the discussion with a, a minute or two of, of comments. 
as Laura pointed out, we've got 36 states in D.C. that have, impl you know, that have adopted the standards. But we know from our experience that the distance from standards adoption to transformed instruction, to transform student work, and to dramatically improve student achievement is a very long road. And our track record of negotiating that role, tra traveling that road successfully is, let's face it, an even at best. Uh, uh, the ability of states and the track record of states and districts in this country working together or more likely working separately uh, to provide high quality curriculum and instructional tools, to provide the human resource systems that prepare, recruit, and retain the best teachers and school leaders, uh, that provide them with the best professional development and support they need, the evaluation and reward systems that basically dramatically change instruction in the classroom. But we just haven't really delivered on that. If we have, we wouldn't be having as many conferences on these issues as we do, we do now. We'd all be off uh, doing something else. So two questions that really frame this discussion. One is, how do we do better this time than we have done in the past? Right. How do we take advantage of or think about the time between when the standards have been adopted and in some cases, the three to four years before a new set of assessments are kicked in, how do we use that time to really bring about the kinds of supports and changes that are necessary? What needs to get done first? How fast do we go? How do we judge our success along the way? How do we know if the implementation strategies that are being put into place are working? Particularly when it will be difficult to measure progress against the results of existing tests, which in some cases depart pretty significantly from where we're aiming. How do we make sure that any efforts to quote unquote implement the standards are actually an integral part of the instructional improvement strategies that are already underway in states and districts and need, may need to be revved up or revised or overhauled in some way, but how do we make sure that implementing the standards is something different than the work that's going on to improve instruction uh, throughout the country? Uh, second related to that is how do we take advantage of the fact that 37 districts have adopted uh, the standards. Uh, to Randy's question, when the hell are we going to create the tools, when we work together to create the tools that people needed? As I pointed out uh, yesterday in my opening remarks, we ought to be able to do things better, cheaper, and faster than doing it on everybody doing it on their own. How are we going to make that happen? Brother, you like better, cheaper, faster? I thought three <laughs> words that describe the new way of doing things might be, uh, uh, might catch on. I'm just trying to checking like that out here. But I want to put, so, so there's a set of essentially technical challenges about getting to the instructional core of the system. But I want to remind, actually I want to let you know about a discussion that occurred here uh, yesterday. If you remember the session on sustaining education reform, we had a number of questions we put up uh, and asked people to vote on them with our highly sophisticated technological system here. So there were two things that caught my eye in that discussion that help provide a different part of the context for the discussion uh, this morning. Uh, when you all were asked um, what part of the college and career ready policy agenda are you most concerned about sustaining when moving forward, the most frequently selected response by about 46 percent of you was having enough resources to intervene with and to provide support to struggling students. And resources was interpreted to not just mean the dollars but the tools and I would argue in some extent the will to provide struggling students with the support they need. That was eye-catching to me. Uh, second, um, uh, at one point uh, uh, we were, you were all asked, who would you consider to be the strongest opposition to sustaining the agenda? And there were a number of choices there, ranging from K-12 to educators to parents, students, higher ed community, business community, et cetera. So almost 60 percent of you said, the K-12 educators and administrators are the biggest obstacles to sustaining this agenda. That's what you all said. So we're in a situation here basically where the people we are counting on to actually get the work done are the ones that many people think are the biggest obstacles to success. So that tells you something about the political environment in which is, this work is going to unfold. So if you all could just provide some simple direct answers <laughs> to how we get the work done. Now, in, in, in all seriousness, those are, that's the environment in which we're, we're operating. So we're, we're going to start with, uh, we're going to start at the bottom up here uh, with Andres. Uh, and tell us a bit about how you're approaching these issues in uh, Baltimore. We're then going to go to Lillian, then to Randy, and then to Vicki. Okay. 
So let me first editorialize and say that the answer might also depend on who's in the room. Uh, the, I, have, uh, I have to tell you, the largest contingent here are K-12 to uh, people from the state level, the K-12 to system. The state level. The, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I guarantee you they're not talking about the state level K-12 educators. Uh, uh, but leaving that aside, the, uh, 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 I feel incredibly hopeful about where we are, and uh, in part because uh, uh, the, the dynamics of reform in Maryland right now are, are quite unique. Uh, there are only 24 districts. And the, the ability for 24 superintendents uh, to collaborate and share knowledge and strategize with a state superintendent is, uh, is quite an asset, uh, uh, as opposed to other states where I've worked where you, know, you have districts in the hundreds. Uh, it just creates a different dynamic around how the work gets done. Uh, uh, secondly, I've been in Baltimore now for three plus years, and I walked in with uh, a lot of history about what the relationship had been with the state. We were a district in corrective action. We're no longer a district in corrective action. And in part, it's because the state proved to be extraordinarily flexible around uh, how innovative we could be and also around uh, how much we could change the frame from completely about compliance to uh, about other things. Uh, I think that the state had learned over time that a top-down approach that assumed that the district had no capacity had not worked, and that at some level there needed to be a very close collaboration with the district and an understanding of where the capacity was in order to move the district forward. And uh, you know, two years later, we, we were out of corrective action. We had made AYP as a district two consecutive years after never having made AYP in a single uh, subgroup in the history of the district. Uh, so a, a good moment for us in terms of our ability to work together uh, for a common purpose. And you know, Nancy Grasm, I guess, is not here. So I can be very free in giving her props, which is that she's been uh, a huge ally in the work. Uh, uh, in, I'm sure in many states, the, the large urban districts uh, don't necessarily feel that way uh, about their district, district bureaucracies. The, uh, the other aspect of the work, which I think is, is, is uh, good for us right now is that we, we have defined this part of the work in exactly the same way we have defined other parts of the work, which is that, uh, and we've looked at the literature and the research, and I think one of the ways in which we can answer that question is we have to learn from the past. And you know we've looked at the literature on implementation of standards in the 90s, on what happened in England in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and we have, we're very conscious of what worked, didn't work, uh, how to go about things differently. My, my, uh, I hire a CAO in the spring uh, with a group of people that included uh, different roles in the district around the table and the question of how, what kind of leadership we were gonna have around the introduction of the standards was so central uh, to uh, the exercise. We, I started meeting with networks of principals in the spring in, in a conversation about how they needed to own this work as opposed to define it as something that was coming from the outside. Uh, in, the, uh, in July, we had a one week uh, uh, leadership uh, setting for all administrators in the system led by the new CAO and the topic was standards with a focus on uh, a task in a classroom. We, we looked at uh, how two classrooms could possibly be teaching one standard and uh, what the difference might mean in terms of what the work needed to be like moving forward and their ability to have discussions with teachers. We brought over 40 teachers into the central office to simply focus on math and they spent the entire summer on peeling one standard one standard so that they could go back as leaders 
uh, and begin a discussion about uh, the gap between what they were doing now, uh, what needed to be done, uh, uh, all around this question of uh, uh, what should children know and be able to do, and what does it take in terms of the knowledge and the skills of the adults, and what are the tasks that uh, we should all be engaged in as adults and in terms of what the children are being asked to do and demonstrate uh, uh, to inform this discussion. We're very conscious that this cannot become a compliance exercise where we're looking to the state for leadership. The state is necessarily going to be the leader because it will adapt standards, it will develop tools, it has tremendous resources around knowledge management across the different districts and organizations like this. But if we make it about waiting for somebody from the outside to tell us uh, you know, what's right and what's wrong around this work, uh, we will always be reactive and behind the eight ball. And, and we are very conscious that when we look at the work in the 1990s about standards, effective districts moved rapidly and well, and ineffective districts uh, trail like crazy and complain for years about what was right and what was not, not right. Uh, so uh, our work is to make it incredibly inclusive. I think that work with teachers in, in during the summer was, was powerful for them. And uh, we have structures in place. We have 10 days of professional development for teachers that, it, that are shared between the district and the schools. Uh, we have a collaborative planning period every week in schools. Uh, for great level discussions about the work. We have the, we have the structures. Uh, uh, the systems are uh, increasingly there, uh, and uh, the question is, can we tap on the capacity that I think is there on the ground uh, so that this is not perceived as something that is being done onto schools, but as uh, something that the schools need to embrace uh, if if the, Stanford, if the standards are meaningful and if they're right. And a lot of the discussion is about whether you know, this is the right thing to be doing, to be teaching for the kids to be learning. And that, of course, is going to require not only uh, you know, under greater understanding, but, but also a lot of work around how to do the work differently. Because if, if it doesn't mean that the work has to be done differently, then, then you know, they're not the right standards. They're not valid. They're not meaningful. So that's sort of where we are. We we are feeling tremendously good about about this work uh, coming into a new year, having had a series of, of systemic discussions that really engage every single person in the system about you know the gap between what we're doing and what we are going to need to be doing in order to change our game in the right direction moving forward. Thank you, Andre. So what you said basically was districts need to move quickly. They need to help classroom teachers understand the standards and own the work and take responsibility for transforming their own practice. Doesn't sound like an obstacle to reform to me. I will also say that it's not simply about helping teachers understand. I think teachers are quite yes. often okay. uh, the most capable people in the room in this discussion and a deficit mentality about teachers and district uh, and a belief that somehow it takes a kind of expert knowledge outside of the classroom to inform work that ultimately is about the classroom is deeply problematic as an instrument of change in school districts. Uh, it takes a coming together of that outside expert knowledge, but a real understanding that sometimes the real experts are already doing it. And it's the, uh, the bureaucratic constraints, the narrowing that I think was such a huge part of how the previous standards work has been about that gets in the work of the kinds of conversation that are going to move us forward. Because ultimately, again, if the standards are the right standards, people are going to need to be smarter about the work. And I don't think people get smarter if somebody is telling them what to do. So uh, uh, 
Uh, that has been our work. And of course, there are huge challenges around capacity and around scale and around ensuring that, that you know, we are approaching the adults with the same kind of differentiation that we approach, ideally, the children. Uh, but my message, and as a superintendent, I have the, you know, that's, that's the, the great tool that I have, which is the, the ability to just frame the conversation. The message has been that, that we, this is not work where we are going to be dependent on the state to tell us these are the standards and this is what you do. <coughs> If we do that, then we are going to be uh, narrowing the work in ways that is going to hurt us. Uh, ideally, we help the state in defining what needs to happen, which should be possible in a district where we have 6,000 teachers. Uh, since I think some of the most extraordinary people teaching in America right now are teaching in my district, just as some of the uh, <laughs> You know, people who need the greatest support are teaching in my district as well. And my, my, my job and the job of everybody around me has to be about tapping on that capacity and, and you know, basically making it something that permeates the district rather than something that is seen as an exception. Very well put. Thank you for that. Lillian, how does this look from the state level? Well, he just made my job harder because I thought I was just going to be able to tell them what to do, and I was done. With it. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't work in Baltimore. <laughs> it, 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 that, that plan, that plan's been scrapped. Um, <laughs> I will say that the Common Core Standards Movement is a very integral part at the state level in Delaware. Um, with that, in fact, um, as a reference, our governor is the co-chair with Governor Purdue from Georgia of the National Governors Association's Common Core Standards Committee. So of course, we engaged very early on in the adoption and the discussion of implementation around the Common Core Standards. We in Delaware have a history of collaboration. So our teachers have always been at the table. And in this instance, size does matter, because to your point, you have 24 districts. We have 19, 18 charter schools and uh, two hours from one end of the state to the other. So we can sit down, have a face-to-face -face conversation at any given point in time. And in our state, really, it is about relationships. And if we do anything to abuse those relationships, something can be derailed quick, fast, and in a hurry. So the planning for our adoption and, and implementation of the Common Core Standards um, has one, is one that has been grounded in, in historical uh, collaboration around curriculum alignment. As a matter of fact, we have administrative code uh, regulation that dictates that the Department of Education work with districts and schools to ensure that there's alignment to the standards of the state. And so once a more robust uh, conversation around Common Core Standards being a key piece of the national reform agenda as it evolved up from the states, during the school year of 2009-10, our state was already engaged in um, curriculum alignment, working with um, a, a consultant, Max Thompson, with the Learning Focus Solutions, um, uh, looking at our current Delaware standards, grouping them into clusters of um, skills and knowledge, and then what, what is most important, if this is ever going to work, is aligning grade level expectations in the actual units that tie back to those standards at each grade level, K through 12, in the four core areas of math, English language, arts, social studies, and science. So when the June 20, um, when in June 2010, when the final draft of the standards were actually published, we were in good shape with our existing standards, and we had the opportunity to work with the Achievement Corporation who had a tool that would go through and do a crosswalk analysis of the current existing standards to the proposed Common Core standards. And what the state team found from that crosswalk was that our standards really were very strongly aligned with the proposed Common Core standards. And what we did then was actually um, get a side-by-side -side comparison completed and published for our teachers to see which immediately um, mitigated a lot of angst. So was it perfectly aligned, our standards, to the proposed standards? No. But what they did know is that somewhere in our body of uh, work, we had the skill sets. They, we would have the resources within our state to make sure that we aligned them 
with the Common Core standards. And so one of our highest priorities, of course, to your point, is to make sure that they understood that this work, this Common Core standards, was seamlessly aligned with our broader uh, reform agenda because without the appropriate standards, the right standards, um, we would not be preparing our students to be college and career ready. So once they were brought to the table with our uh, DOE team, um, and I just have to give kudos to the people in the Department of Education in Delaware who are leading this work on the ground because they are meticulous about making sure that we, we are very inclusive. What we really focused on to the point that the previous panel made was that we are bringing on a new assessment. And, when, and just let me put out here, we are in both a consortia for the, um, the National Common Core possibilities. And when we worked with our vendor, AIR, around our new assessment, they, go, they came to Delaware with the understanding that this was going to morph into um, the national assessment movement. But what we're moving from is that one-time summative assessment, um, K through eight, and then that one-time assessment at the high school level to a K to eight computer-based adaptive assessment K through eight, and then the end of course assessments at the high school level. So now that we have this new assessment coming on board, with the Common Core standards being adopted at the same time, gives us a perfect opportunity to phase in as we need to, that in, and as we should, the standards with the assessment so that it makes sense for our teachers. And that to be able to demonstrate to them that that strong match that the Achieve tool demonstrated was going to make their work much easier and it was going to be a matter of prioritizing and phasing in instead of recreating a will um, really did mitigate a lot of angst for our teachers. So what we've got to talk about in our state now as we implement this work is exactly what the previous panel talked about, teacher familiarity and phase in um, with the adoption. We told them immediately, we are adopting the standards, which we have done. Do not think that tomorrow your life completely changes. Because we know as we've pushed rigor um, further down into the earlier grades, if we were even to try to simultaneously adopt the standards, we're setting people up for failure. Because if the rigor has changed in the earlier grades, they would not have the prerequisite knowledge to even be prepared at the higher grades to um, do well in showing student assessment. So to ensure, so great, this is great. We do this all the time. We say this in education all the time. We have shown them these um, clusters of skills and knowledge, and we've published the side-by-side -side comparison. How do we ensure fidelity of implementation and engagement is the next question. And we have implemented several ways to do that. Number one is that we have published the standards, but we have published the standards in the side by side, not just put it on there and say, go check the website and see what's going on. Our teachers have been working beginning with the draft of the Common Core Standards before the final was even completed. When we started the work around the um, grade level expectations alignment with our current uh, standards, once the draft standards for Common Core were published, we pulled that into the discussion and conversation. So they were already making the comparisons before we even used the Achieve tool to see where there were commonalities and to look at the grade level expectations in the teaching units. We sponsored peer review um, sessions with teacher made units around these grade level expectations that align to the standards. And we have published what our teachers not the Department of Education, what our teachers have deemed as exemplary units. Again, to the point that was made earlier, if we put tools in their hands, it certainly does lessen the anxiety they have about actually trying to do the work in a robust way. And then I will reiterate that one of our most salient points in implementing the standards is that we are bringing on a new assessment. And so, as we are doing the standard setting, the cut scores for our new assessment, and because our K through eight assessment is adaptive, we can phase in the Common Core standards um, with our test item analyses because we're going to be testing to see uh, our children are performing above or below grade level on the adaptive piece anyway. And 
one of the huge pieces of our reform effort is to have a data coach in every single school working with all of our teachers around the four common um, core areas, ELA, math, science, and social studies, and they have to devote 90 minutes a week with this data coach, which will help spe special skills not only around content knowledge, but around test analyses too. And they will, for those weeks, look at those data. And now that we have a common formative assessment statewide, they will be working with those teachers to look at the student performance data, but to also do an item analysis of the, the uh, assessment tool. So we, we will have good feedback as we're phasing in these common core standards of how our teachers are interacting and planning to make sure that we have uh, the supports for them that they need. So the huge piece is, and, and we had this conversation earlier when uh, some of us on the panel talked, how does one adopt the standards and say then we're going to have an implementation, uh, implementation period of because what educators would tend to say, I've, I've been one for a long time, here we go again, we've adopted the standards, they won't be fully implemented until X, I have some time. With this integration of the assessment phase in and working with our vendor to do that, we keep a sense of urgency around we've got to get this done early on because the time is marching on and these standards are going to grow. But the standards will grow and our assessment will grow with the teacher's familiarity of the standards because we will phase it in that way. One of the things that was said early on, and that's, this is a huge conversation that we're having in Delaware, um, and of course the Casey Foundation uh, affirmed it, what happens in K through two before those students get to the third grade? So we're also looking um, at working with the state of Maryland and looking, stilling shamelessly from Ohio, uh, mm -hmm. what they're doing to gauge student preparedness for kindergarten. And then we're going to be working statewide with our early care providers uh, so that we can track back. We already have a STARS program where we can um, rate our early care providers based on the quality of the um, interaction around social emotional and um, academic interventions so we know where students are coming from that are doing good things and we will try to provide professional development for our early care providers too and then finally i will end with um, senate bill 151 one of the first bills that governor markell signed into law when he came on board was an academic achievement award and we use the um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds, and then our Race to the Top funds will proliferate um, the existence of this program uh, through 2015. And what we're looking at is our lowest achieving Title I schools each year, and we're going to award 150,000 to each of the five schools that show um, progress in closing the achievement gap and or making AYP and they can do whatever they want with that money they can reward their teachers through stipends they can do whatever they want they have to form a committee though that includes teachers leaders and community members to help develop that so that's how we're going to ensure that even in those schools where there may not have been true implementation and integrity around rigor and, and aligning standards with what was actually going on grade level by grade level, uh, we're giving them incentives to make sure that they're on board. And with that, we have a new evaluation system coming on board that's going to tie teacher leader effectiveness to the student growth. And again, our teachers are at the table with us. We have statewide committees working on what those indicators of success will mean above and beyond just um, the statewide assessment. So everyone has a vested interest in making sure that they know these standards. And one of the things that we're doing, because we don't want to send them off with the standards and say, go read this and come back and do good work, we are going to be working with our teachers throughout the year. We've already trained cadres of teachers from every district and charter school who will be help us do the turnaround training so that we are step by step walking them through the standards. We don't, we're not going to leave it up to them just to think that they read it, we're going to walk them through it step by step to make sure that we give professional development around to each one. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Randy, lots of talk so far about uh, engaging teachers, teacher collaboration, a little bit of talk now about uh, teacher evaluation, excuse me? 
some music to our ears. <laughs> well, that's what I want to find out. A little bit of talk about teacher evaluation. Also, I know you have been really, really sort of pushing and leading your members to a stronger teacher value, uh, notion of a stronger teacher evaluation. Is this music to your, to your ears? Is this where you were hoping Common Core would go? No, what, this is good stuff. From what both um, uh, the, from what both Lillian and Alonzo said, this is good stuff. Let me just, let me take it back a step and then I'm gonna do something I almost never, ever, ever, ever do. I'm gonna actually put a couple of slides up. Um, so, but this is, when, when Mike started with the, um, that the notion that in this room, you think that the biggest obstacles um, are pretty much, maybe with the exception of Vicki, those of us sitting up on the panel here. <laughs> um, I started thinking um, that I'm gonna start where I was about to end. So instead of just trying to end in this conclusion and bring you there, I'm gonna start there, which is there's two different um, dichotomies here, um, which is we all feel this urgency of helping to get kids to where they need to be given the global economy. That this is about how we prepare kids as we always have attempted for life, but also now for college and I would say career. And so we all kind of agree on that and then have, that's part of the reason why we've all agreed about this, uh, the standards and about the assessments and things like that. I, want, I, I don't wanna, I don't want to, you know, um, talk too much about that. There's huge agreement, not only in this room, but probably universally. This is where the disagreement is. So then what? So there are those of us who kind of have toiled in this field and have gotten to the point where we have an America that is littered with great pilots throughout the country. And we're really bad at scaling up sustaining and building capacity. We are really bad at that in our field. And those of you who are not in our field are so frustrated that basically what you want is waiting for Superman. I, and I'm not talking about it in terms of the film. You're hoping that we just adopt the Nike just do it. So we can find you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of iconic people like Lillian and Alonzo. I do not include myself in that. Um, who you can just plop in and say, okay, just do it. And so, and if you don't, why not? Don't you care about kids? And then it's, okay, I'm gonna fear you into it. So there's been this absence of an investment and support strategy and a design and implementation system that both Lillian and Alonzo articulated. So what happens for teachers is they say, basically, okay, what do we do? But they never say it out loud because they think if they tell you, if you, if they let their hair down, you're just going to say, you're not worth it and we're gonna get somebody new. So what teachers really need and I can do this in all the pedagogical terms, but I'd rather do it like this. They need the tools, and some of them have been talked about thus far, but this is what they need. They need to see, they need to touch, they need to feel, they need to try and try and try, and you have to let them take that risk, the risk to fail. And so when it's all of this, okay, what happens with the test scores, the test scores, the test scores, it immobilizes them totally and completely because the one thing they want for our kids is for our kids to succeed. So that's the biggest, in my judgment, the biggest issue here is how do we do what Alonzo says, where we are right now, where we have to go, and how do we build the systems both design systems and implementation systems to do that. So these are my two slides. Slide number one. So this is, and I take no credit for this slide, I have shamelessly stolen it from the Gates Foundation. <laughs> but look 
at this slide. Think about, and I'm a social studies teacher, so I want you to focus on um, both what we need to do and how to do it. In terms of the work of the new age, we need to help kids learn how to critically think. So if you look at this, this slide basically says, how do we help kids in terms of an analysis and how do we help kids in terms of comparison? And you can read it yourself, I'm not gonna read it for you, but I, I gravitated to this because of the social studies task. So what does this slide do? Its purpose is to translate the common core reading and writing standards into what students are asked to do and how we know they can do it, how we see it, how we feel it, how we touch it, how they show that they can. The template, and this one, and again, I give the Gates Foundation tremendous credit, the template gives teachers clear guidance. Teachers, we can read it and say, I got that, I understand that. They create some commonality without dictating instruction. It can be adjusted to different subjects, but as I said, because I taught history in New York City for six years, this is the slide that means something to me. So look at what we as teachers need to do. We have to help guide kids to read and comprehend texts. We have to help guide them to weigh the competing discourses. We have to help figure out in our classes how they then pick a side and how they then cite examples and evidence to support their position. So, how do we do this? Normally, if you are Joe teacher like I was, we would be up at four o'clock in the morning, this is when I did my lesson plans, and do this kind of work alone. How am I gonna take these outcomes, deconstruct them, so that I can guide my kids or teach my kids to do all of this? So ultimately, how do we, and now I'm gonna put the next slide up before I close. So how do we then mesh all of these tools that you now see here and requirements together so that we can answer the question I just asked myself in terms of a successful lesson about whether or not presidential policies make a difference in the lives of Americans. So in most of the conversations we have in rooms like this, we would spend the time defining curriculum, defining resources for students, defining professional development, defining formative assessments, maybe data. We may not spend enough time talking about labor management relationships, talking about accountability the way I would like to, talking about tools, time, and trust, but we would actually spend a lot of time talking 35,000 feet above classrooms about these tools. My point to all of you is that we need to, you need to sit and think about this, and I'm sorry if I'm saying it that assertively, from the teacher's standpoint. They need tools, more important than tools, you get that. They need time and they need trust. The kind of example I just went through was the kind of example Alonzo went through about math in Baltimore this summer, where they spent so much time on one lesson trying to figure out how to create that knowledge for and amongst themselves so that they can create it in their classrooms. It's what Lillian is trying to do throughout Delaware, create the time for people to work together, knowing this is real work, so that they can deconstruct what I was doing at four o'clock in the morning. So if I leave you with anything, it is that teachers need, if we actually believe in real implementation and not the Nike way. I'm not saying anything bad about Nike as a company. <laughs> but if we actually believe that we have to capacity build, scale, and sustain, and implement with fidelity, then for teachers to see, touch, feel, try, and take risks, there has to be real time. That's a huge investment issue. And there has to be real time for people to talk to each other 
and work together, and there must be what I call 360 degree accountability, meaning accountability up as well as accountability down. You all know, I don't have to talk about it, that we have looked ourselves in the mirror to talk about our own accountability and stepping up with that. But for this to be successful, it means we need to actually treat teachers as we want them to be. They want to own this work. They want kids to be successful. But we need to give them the real support and resources and investment to make this work. And when districts do, like what Lillian is trying to do in Delaware, and I've seen it in terms of the ABC School District in California, when you trust them that there will be a real engagement, then there is a real engagement. The meetings they have, for example, in ABC right now in terms of labor management meetings, never talk about human resources anymore except when it's connected to instruction. Virtually all their labor management meetings are now about how we improve instruction for kids and the human resources we need in order to do that. So teachers want to do this work. Our union wants to do this work. But we have to do this work right this time or else no one on the outside world will believe that we can do this. Thank you.